Okay, it's fabulous speaker time. I'm holding her presentation. Okay, good morning. Uh, before we get to our speaker for today, I just want to let you know who our speaker is going to be next week because at the end of the meeting last week, I never had a chance to advise that Connie was going to be speaking. So our speaker next week is going to be Tom Badsek. He works at the Flathead Biological Station, which is part of UM. He hopefully is going to explain to us what's going on in Flathead Lake, uh, which if you like pretty stories, probably you shouldn't come. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, our speaker today is our own Connie Myers. I sent out her bio with the email that advised you about the Zoom. And the reason I did that is because it's an extensive bio and Connie very explicitly said, don't repeat it. So, Connie, welcome. Thank you. and close to the top. Further, 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 further. Let's uh, a sheet for about there. Alrighty. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this because number one, I can't move around and number two, where the heck am I going to put my notes if they won't let me lay it down here on the on the podium, but we'll get it figured out. Well, you can lay it on the podium. We'll just yell at you if you've disconnected your video. Sounds good. Oh. Well, hey, before we get started, I did want to give a public shout out to the gyms, Jim Wiley and the other gym, the other. for keeping this group not just going, but thriving. I mean, we added members during the pandemic. So a big round of applause for figuring out the Zoom. <laughs> when your best isn't good enough? What do you do when no amount of working harder, faster, longer, stronger, more creatively makes any difference whatsoever? Has anybody been in that situation before? I, hear, I see some nods. How about here on the Zoom? Yeah, I see some nods yeah. there as well. Well, that's the question I was struggling to answer. When a senior as an undergrad, I was failing Third term organic chemistry for not the first time, but the second time. So unlike brilliant people in the room like Richard, this was a chore and I had a really hard time with it. So I went, what do you do when it's the last, uh, the last gasp? I mean, I've done, I did everything I could. So what do you do? Well, you go see the professor, right? So I sat down with the professor and I asked him advice. What can I do to be better on this? What do I have to do to master this material? He said, well, what I would do is I would uh, do the equations over and over and over until you get them right. So out of my backpack, I pulled a three ring binder. Not just any three ring binder, the mother <laughs> of all three ring binders. That looks something like this six inch in here. Now, trust me, I didn't save my equations. This is not what that is, but it was this big. And he looked at me and he was impressed. And he said, well, another thing you could do is get a tutor. And I said, he's outside waiting to see how this conversation goes. And I thought, okay, this is it. He says, well, I'm thinking, I have demonstrated I'm the real deal. I've done the work. He's gonna give me the silver bullet on how to master the material. And he leans in and he looks me in the eye and he says, well, I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, wait, what? You don't know what to tell me? You're the professor? How in the world? Am I going to get through this? So devastated, to say the least, I shoved that three-ring binder back in my backpack, thanked him for his time, 
walked out the door. My tutor was gone. He was on to somebody else at this point. And I found myself walking across campus all alone. It was during class period. And I just was devastated. What do you do when you've done everything you can, but it is not enough? So I just cried out, God, help me. And as I walked across campus, a little thought came to mind. And I thought, there is something wrong with this picture. How in the world can I be failing third term organic chemistry while at the same time, I'm teaching biology labs? So I'm not stupid. I'm not incapable. I just don't get it. So it hit me. I started thinking about how I see myself in this course and how different that is from any other course. What I saw was I failed once, I'm gonna fail again, I won't graduate from college, I won't get a job, I'll end up living under a bridge and my parents will disown me. That is what I saw. And it occurred to me how wrong that was because that wasn't the case with any other course that I had ever done. How many of you have heard of Gilbert and Sullivan? Anybody, Pirates of Penzance for one. <laughs> so it was William Sullivan that said this, quote, losers visualize the penalties of failure. Winners visualize the rewards of success. So what was I visualizing? Failure, absolute failure. Now, why is that important? Well. A gentleman uh, by the name of Dr. Charles Garfield in his book, Peak Performance, did a mental training research on elite Russian athletes before the 1980 Olympics. Let me pull out the sheet so you can see it here without turning off anything. They were divided into four groups. Group number one spent 100% of their time doing physical training. Group number two did 75% in physical training and 25% mental training. Group three did 50-50, physical and mental. And group four did 25-75. Or wait, did I get that right? Yeah, 25% physical, training and 75% mental. So I want to ask this group, at the end of the Olympics, which group do you think performed the best? Okay, anybody for group one? No group ones? Here on Zoom even? How about group two? No group twos. How about group three? We got some group threes here. Group threes on uh, Zoom? Anybody? Anybody? There's another one. Well, in fact, it was group four. It was group four. The, the athletes at that level are elite. They are all at the same level from a physical standpoint. On any given day, once you get to that level, we're talking about your mental stamina, your ability to see and your ability to do. So the more vivid the image, the more effective it is. You see what you want. Is that about right? See what you picture, not what you want. So anybody, has anybody been watching the Olympic trials? A few of you. So we're really into swimming. So we watched almost all of the uh, swimming trials. And for those of you who don't know, there was a young woman from Missoula who made it all the way to the finals. And she made it in fourth place in the final race. So she missed the cutoff by just a, a smidgen. But anyway, anybody heard of Katie Ledecky? Yes, everybody, a lot of people have heard of Katie Ledecky. How about here on Zoom, anybody? Yeah, a couple of folks. Well, she is the greatest swimmer of all time. The GOAT, as it were. She's won five Olympic gold medals, 15 world championship gold medals, the most in history for a female swimmer. She is the record, world record holder in six different events. And she was asked this question, what do you see before you get up on that starting block? 
She goes, well, I see way before I get on the starting block. I don't wait till then. She said, I visualize my races every night before I go to bed with a stopwatch in my hand. And on that stopwatch, I have written down or, or set to the speed that I expect to go that next race. And sure enough, I get what I see. So how incredibly difficult or, or important it is that we see what we want to have happen and do that in a positive and incredibly uh, detailed way. So you got to see it. And then I, I, so I was getting excited at this point. I'm thinking, here's something I could do. Here's something I can change. Maybe I'll get better. Maybe I'll pass this course. And I kept thinking about where I was and what I said. How I talked to myself about it was vastly different than any other course that I'd ever taken. Again, I was saying, this is only for smart people. You're not smart. You're only average. In fact, in this course, you're stupid. So how do you think that I'm going to do if that's the way that I go into every time I open that book? So how important it is to change what you say? Again, keeping with the Olympic thing, every, anybody heard of Simone Biles? OK, the greatest what of all time? Gymnast. Gymnast of all time. And she was asked, what do you say to yourself before each competition? And she says, well, it's very, very simple. I don't make a big deal out of it. Basically, what I say is, you've got this. Have confidence. So I switched the way that I started seeing. I switched the way that I started talking about that course and appreciated, as I hope you guys do, that the single most important conversation you're going to have today is with yourself. How you speak to yourself matters. So see it. Say it. What would be the next thing you ask? There's a third truth that I discovered that you guys are going to discover for yourself. So here's some audience participation time. I want you to stick your arm out, whichever arm it is you want. Tense it up. Now put your hand on the table and try to tap your fingers. How does that feel? Now I want you to loosen your arm and tap your fingers. Which one works better? Loose. The loose one, the relaxed one. When you go into situations all tensed up, it's very, very difficult to perform. So I want you to do one more thing. Oftentimes I ask people to stand up, but I won't do that to you guys today. I want you to sit up straight in your chair. I want you to put your shoulders back and down. I want you to lift your eyes and your chin. Now, just the opposite. Drop your gaze, drop your chin, drop your shoulders. What's the difference? How do you feel when you're standing, sitting up straight with that shoulder back and that head up? How do you feel? Ready to go. What? Ready to go. Confident, right? As opposed to the opposite. Uh, well, maybe. Well, I'm not sure. So once again, I thought I have to do a better job of presenting myself when I lay that particular book down. So, see it, say it, feel it. One more thing, actually a couple more things, but one more thing is you have to believe it. Well, let me give you a story to help illustrate the difference between thinking and believing. Some of you have probably heard this story, it's that good. In 1959, Charles Blondin was the very first tightrope walker across Niagara Falls. 1,000 feet across, 150 feet in the air, over the course of a decade, he crossed this uh, and back 10 different times. And he did it in every uh, exciting way possible. In addition to the obvious, you know, where you have the balance pole, he would go out to the middle and with that balance pole, do a somersault and get back up and walk across. He would do it on stilts even. But the most famous approach that he took is he had a wheelbarrow and he pushed this wheelbarrow over that 1,000 feet and he pushed it back and the crowd went wild. 
They're screaming, they're cheering, they're yelling. And he says, well, do you think I could do it again? And he's like, yes, you can do it again. And he goes, well, do you believe I can do it again? Yes, we believe you can do it again. And what was the question he asked? Who is going to get in? <laughs> so the difference between thinking and believing is you are all in. So was I all in? Not so much. I still didn't think that I could actually do it. Now, what I would like for you to do is take your envelope that you have. Zoomers, you're going to have to visualize this. Take your envelope. Open it up and pull out what's inside. Huh. Now what I want you to do is whichever arm is closest to the table, that's the, the hand you're going to use. I want you to put it, put the string between your forefinger and your thumb, and I want you to rest your forearm on the table, but leave the string hanging down. Okay, unimpeded. Does that make sense? You can use your other hand to stop the thing from swinging. Okay, use your other hand. Now this really only works when you have your forearm stationary. If you have it like this, it's pretty tough. So, make it stop swinging, reach down there and stop it. Have you done that? Okay, what I want you to do now is look down at it. Look at it. And I want you to picture it moving around in a clockwise direction. Just visualize it. Nobody starts swinging that thing, all right? That's cheating. I want you to just watch it and feel it. And what do you see happening? Anything? Yeah. What's happening, Jim? It is going around in a clock counterclockwise circle. Okay, he doesn't listen to instructions very well. He went <laughs> counterclockwise instead of clockwise, but that's all right. I, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm unique. How about anybody else? What are you seeing happen? Nice. Swinging around the circle. How about that? Now, why is that? Why is that happening? Anybody got any ideas on why that's happening? Mary Baker Eddy is doing it. Mind over matter. Absolutely. Your brain cannot operate separately from your body, vice versa, okay? Your brain, un that you can't even sense, is sending messages to your shoulder, to your arm, to your forearm, to your hand, to your fingers, and it is doing what your brain says. So, what does that tell you? This is, this is legit stuff. This is the real deal. Okay, so you can put your nut away, so to speak. So see it, say it, feel it. What was this one? Believe it. Believe it. Okay, what does that leave us? Do it. Do it. Okay, you've got six birds on a wire, three decide to leave. How many birds are left on the wire? Six. Why six? Decision does not equal action, all right? So even though I had done all this homework and, and, and understood what I needed to change, unless you implement that change, that's all it is. It's just up in your head. And that's not going to be very helpful. In fact, Amelia Earhart once said, the most difficult thing to do is to act. The rest is merely tenacity. So once again... It comes down to those five things, and I wanted to share, and how many people here have seen the movie Wizard of Oz? Everybody's seen Wizard of Oz. I don't know about you, but as a very young child when I saw that movie, I was absolutely traumatized by the flying monkeys. Okay, that said, what was the tin man looking for? The tin man was looking for a heart. What was the lion looking for? Courage. Courage. What was the scarecrow looking for? Brain. A brain. Kathy's like, huh? <laughs> She's looking for her brain. So they go on this huge, long, dangerous, scary journey, and all that uh, Dorothy wanted was to go home with Toto. That was it. But they're on this huge journey. They get to Oz, and what do they find? 
What did they find when they got there? A scared, lonely, little old man hiding behind smoke and mirrors. But he did something for them. What did he do? Uh, can I reach this? What did he give the tin man? He gave the tin man a heart. Did I disappear? Yeah, we just have to. Uh, Here, we can move this. Turn on the video. We can move this. I'm done with it. We can keep that. I can keep that in my hand. Oh, where it says video. Yeah. There. Drop. So the tin man got what? A heart. Tin man got a heart. What did the lion get for courage? What did he get that represented courage? He got a medal. Okay. What did the scarecrow get? A certificate. He got a diploma, right? Kathy's redeemed herself. <laughs> she, so the question is this Did those trinkets have any power in and of themselves? Absolutely not. <laughs> Does that nut and string have any power in and among itself? <coughs> Jim thinks so. It doesn't, right? All that the, the wizard did was give them permission through those trinkets to tap into power that already exists in them. So obviously, I didn't fail. I passed the course, not only passed it, I got the highest grade on the final in that particular course. So that was kind of a big deal. I only passed with a C, but hey, we'll take it. We'll take it. So I made these changes, and I ended up graduating, and I ended up doing just fine. So I wonder how many of you here today have already gone through something like this, just didn't put words to how it worked, or some of you who want to do some, something new and something different but are being held back, either by how you see things, what you say, how you feel about it, do you believe it, and are you gonna do it? So, at the end of the day, this is the audience participation. Do you remember? What is it that you have to do? See it. See it. Believe it and do it. And that's it. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Zoomers. Do you want any questions? Oh, sure. Questions or comments or people that have examples they want to share. Yeah. Yes. I can remember during my puberty time when I'm growing to become an individual independent from the family. How very effective and important it was for some older men taking under their wing and to, to just give you confidence. You know? Yeah, so Cookie here here is pointing out how important it is for elders, as it were, to come alongside youth so that they have models that get them through life in a more positive way. Absolutely. Any other comments or observations about challenges that you've had? See it, say it, feel it, believe it. After saying, you feel, believe and do. Uh huh. Okay, that's five items. That's right. Anybody on Zoom have any observations to make? You have to get Jim to listen. Uh, yeah, if they raised their hand the last time. I don't see any raised hands. It was all so clear. <laughs> Again, any, anybody else want to share their personal examples? I remember, Larry, the story of your wife and how she inspired you to make some changes in the, your art. Her mantra with me, when I would, like a typical artist, I'm always looking for new challenges, moving on, moving on. She would try to get me to verbalize it. And what she usually would do is when she heard enough of me moaning and groaning and running around, what do you want? Mm. And what I loved about that is it brought it back to you. The, heart. the rest of it I'm reacting. 
yeah, I did, but that isn't going to weigh on mother and all that stuff. And she would listen to that and get it, so I could get it out of my system. And then she would say, Larry, what do you want? So what Larry Perney, uh, Hear You Zoomers, has just described is uh, how easy it is to take a shotgun approach to uh, life and creativity and how important it is to focus. And his wife is the one who said, no, it's not just about what you think, it's about what you want. It's about kind of what's in your heart. That's what it is that you need to follow. Anybody else? Yes, sir. When I was at the University of Montana, I was in athletics, so I was around athletes. And there was a young man in Great Falls, out of Great Falls, he was the punter for the Grizzlies. Six foot four, just visualized, big blonde kid, muscular. And he came to me one day and said, I need a space where it's quiet. So I would take him to the stadium and he'd lay on the floor in the president's suite for an hour and visualize his kicking. Wow. Well, he was a very successful puncher. Yeah. And a second uh, a wrestling coach, Doc Bliss, he would open his practice sessions with the mental exercises mm -hmm. every practice session. Mm -hmm. And the Grizzlies won their first Big Sky Wrestling Championship in history under Scott Bliss. And he went on to the University of Oregon and became a very well-known So Zoomers, coach. what Gary has shared with the group is that athletes have known about visualization and imagery for a long time. And there was a punter at the University of Montana who would spend an hour laying in the president's suite, visualizing how he was going to do, and ended up being incredibly successful. And similarly, a wrestling coach started off every one of his practices with imagery and visualization for his group, and they ended up winning the very first championship, Big Sky Championship, Big Sky championship in wrestling. In wrestling. So, good stuff. Well, again, thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week. Jay, Jim, did you want to talk about who the next no, speaker is? No, I already mentioned it. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys.